on the on your slides rather. Um, okay, perfect. And then I just want to quickly introduce. Uh, we're so delighted to have Dr. Carson Stringer today. So, uh, Dr. Stringer is a group leader at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, Genalia Research Campus. She did her postdoctoral work there with Marius Petrotariu and Carl Svoboda. Um, and she previously did her PhD work at the University College London uh, with Kenneth Harris. And today we'll be hearing a little bit from her about her work on raster map, which is a manifold embedding algorithm for large scale high dimensional data. So thanks so much for being here. Thanks, thanks for having me. Um, I have the, the Crowdcast open on another screen. Wait, can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. Sorry, I had the Crowdcast open on another screen, so I should be able to see questions, but also I'll let you moderate too. Perfect, yeah, and if there's, uh, if you wanna stop, we can, uh, you can stop at any point for questions, but I can, if there's anything super pressing, I'll let you know, like if your sound cuts out or something. Cool, thanks. Okay, so I'm interested in how the brain encodes the visual world and how it internally represents behaviors. So to understand how neurons work together to build these types of representations, we need to record many neurons. So I've worked uh, on developing tools to record thousands of neurons simultaneously in the mouse brain. And so I'll tell you a little bit about those tools and then I'll describe kind of the scientific results we found with this large scale data. In particular, that neural responses to visual stimuli were high dimensional. And then also, now that we know that the, the structure of neural activity is high dimensional, uh, we developed an algorithm that exploits the structure called raster map uh, to be able to visualize uh, large scale data. So to record uh, many thousands of neurons in mice, so you make a, you basically make a small window here in the mouse skull. And this, um, I know you're fMRI people, so I'll just say quickly, this is kind of a, a chronic prep. So the, the mice live with this little hole and we record many days. So they live the rest of their life like this and it's not too mean. Um, so basically we're able to record using this technique called calcium imaging with a microscope over this little hole. And uh, these neurons are expressing uh, proteins that light up when calcium comes into the cell. And so you can see these cells lighting up here. So that's when they're firing. So that's what one of these recordings looks like. And so a lot, many people just record from maybe one plane, one field of view, but we zoom out and we record from many planes simultaneously in depth through, through the mouse brain. And so we're able to, there's a trade-off, we're only able to record at three hertz, but that's uh, sufficient for the types of questions that we're trying to answer. So what does this large scale data look like? So here's, I'm gonna show a video on the right of the data. Uh, each of these squares is one of these planes in depth. And then this upper square uh, in the upper left is the, the image that's being flashed on the screen in front of the mouse at the same time. Now you can see what the mouse is doing down here. So it's free to run on the ball, you'll see. So you can see these neurons firing in response to these stimuli. Uh, in particular, you'll see how much the brain lights up relative to spontaneous activity when there's no stimuli coming in. So these microscopes are relatively standard, uh, but there weren't uh, fast and accurate processing pipelines for this kind of data. Most people were sort of circling ROIs manually. So we created a pipeline called SV2P, which extracts these neurons simult uh, uh, quickly and accurately from, from these neural recordings. So that's how we're able to get these simultaneous recordings of many thousands of neurons. And so each of these little uh, colored circles is, is a mask for a single cell. And then to compute the activity over time, uh, you take the sum of those pixels inside that mask and, and so that intensity across time, and then you get traces like this for each of these neurons. So this is the, the type of, of data that we're working with now. So it's gonna be neurons by time or neurons by visual stimuli. So, so now we wanted to ask the question, now we have these large scale recordings with the many thousands of neurons, what is the dimensionality of neural responses to visual stimuli? And this is an important question because there's different functional consequences of, of how the brain processes the external world, depending on whether or not its representations are high or low dimensional. So in the visual system, you have some image that's shown on the screen and then it comes into your retina, which you can think of as just being a bunch of fancy post-processing filters. And then it goes through to the thalamus 
And then from the thalamus to the visual cortex, there's there's basically 50 times more neurons, at least in the visual cortex, representing this, the external stimulus than there are in the thalamus. So there's this expansion of the signal. So there's two uh, possible hypotheses for why there's this expansion of the single signal. One of them is that the, each of these thalamic neurons, for instance, maybe drive 100 uh, visual cortical neurons, and they all do the same thing together. So you have these groups of many neurons doing the same thing. And this is a, a low dimensional code. Um, but it's so it doesn't represent many visual features, but it's robust to noise that, that might be in the circuit. Then another hypothesis would be that responses are instead uh, high dimensional, that all these neurons are coding different visual features. And there's kind of an expansion uh, of the space in visual cortex. And so that might have an advantage that it might make it easier to in, to build downstream decoders uh, of, of the world, for instance, to classify whether or not this is a tiger um, if you have this high dimensional representation rather than this low dimensional representation. So to quantify dimensionality, uh, we're going to use the eigenvalues of the system. So I'll explain to you what eigenvalues are. So we have this matrix of many neurons by stimuli and we show 2,800 stimuli to the mice. Uh, and we show them twice, so we, we're actually doing a cross-validated technique to get to do the principal components, but I'm not going to go into how that works. You can ask me about it offline. Um, so we're going to do principal components to get the eigenvalues. So we have, here's an example of how principal components work. So we're going to take the first, let's say we take the first three rows in this matrix. So these are neurons one, two, and three. Each of these dots is a single column in this, in this matrix. So this represents uh, the firing of these three neurons to a single stimulus. And then we, you can imagine we have many more of these axes, but just in, in 3D, we can draw the principal components of the responses to these stimuli. And so the top three principal components look like this, where the top principal component is this direction where the neural responses vary the most across this set of stimuli. PC2 has the second most amount of variance, and then PC3 has the third most, and so on. And you can, and you can extract these principal components from, from the neural data. So, these, uh, e the, the lengths of these principal components are the variances, uh, are variances basically uh, how much the, the neural activity varies across these, these axes, and those are the eigenvalues of the system. So we're going to basically make a plot of variance as a function of PC dimension as we go down one PC, two, three, and so on. And so for instance, for a low dimensional system, you would get an eigenvalue spectrum that looks something like this, where you have five principal components, say, or maybe even three that are significant, and then the rest are zero. So this is, a, this is an example where you can kind of fit your system. Maybe you have thousands of neurons, but you can fit it into kind of like a three-dimensional box uh, and explain all the activity with just kind of three dimensions. You could alternatively have a high-dimensional system where the eigenvalue spectrum would then be flat, where every there, all of these directions have lower variance, but the, it means that the system is exploring many of these different directions, and you can't explain the system by putting it into a little box. So I'll give you two examples of a low-dimensional and a high-dimensional code to kind of make this more clear. So an example of a, a low-dimensional code would be uh, these uh, tuning curves here, these wide tuning curves, where this is a one-dimensional stimulus, and we have the responses of each of these neurons, which are colored in different colors. And this is a this is a low dimensional code where there's only two eigenvalues which are significant, and then the rest are zero. And if we take a random projection of this neural activity, so we just take three dimensions out of the thousand uh, neurons that we have, then we get something along the stimulus dimension that's like a circle. So we we just basically if we move a little bit in stimulus space, the the representation doesn't change very much. It changes smoothly because we have these wide tuning curves. So as you, as one neuron starts to slowly turn off, another one turns on and you move slowly through the stimulus space. And this will make you more robust to noise. Uh, alternatively, you could have something like a high dimensional code where this in this case, this is a sparse high dimensional code where every neuron is coding for a different stimulus. So each neuron is one of these spikes here that codes for a different stimulus. And th then this gives a variance spectrum that's flat. So every single eigenvector in the system is actually a different neuron, and they each have equal variance because each of the neurons has an equal firing rate uh, in, in response to its own stimulus. 
And then if you look at this random projection, you get something like a spiky ball, because if you move any small amount in the stimulus space, the representation completely changes. A totally different neuron is encoding your stimulus. So this is a system that's not robust to noise, but might have more precision in terms of coding for the stimulus with these very sharp tuning curves. Uh, so many studies in the past in neuroscience have concluded that neural activity is low dimensional. Um, but these studies were limited in terms of the number of stimuli they showed and also the number of neurons recorded. So now we, we have um, the ability to record this many neurons and show many stimuli. So we're going to try to answer this question in our large scale data and see what is the eigenspectrum of these neural responses. And what we found was that the neural eigenspectrum was, was neither of these. It, didn't, it doesn't look like it's a few values and then goes to zero. It also didn't look like a flat line. What we found instead was that the eigenspectrum decayed like a power law of one over n and to the alpha where alpha is one. So this is approximately one over n. So this is a high dimensional code. We can't fit this code into a box, um, but it's also not a flat, de totally decorrelated code. These neurons also co-vary together uh, within this stimulus space. So for instance, a majority of stimuli are going to kind of activate the neurons along these top principal components. And then there will be uh, subgroups of stimuli that kind of drive these smaller principal components of, of the neural activity. And, and this, uh, and I'll show you an example of a 1D model with a power law, so you can kind of get an idea of what this might look like. So if we, this is an example of a 1D model that has this eigenspectrum. And what you can see is it's, you're still able to move along this 1D space and you have this, this uh, maintain, this, it maintains this, this global structure kind of, but you're still, you have these kind of finer scale details that are able to be represented with these higher uh, principal components that are non-zero. Whereas in the case of, of a low dimensional code, you don't have any um, weight in those principal components. So you're, it, so what we, what we think of uh, this, this power law eigenspectrum is doing is it's kind of balancing two, uh, two goals uh, of, of the neural code. So one, co one uh, goal is to have as much cap capacity as possible. You wanna encode as much information about the visual world as possible. Uh, and, and this will make it easier for downstream decoders to be able to kind of pull various features that they wanna use to, to do computations. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to be so high dimensional and, and sparse and decorrelated like this, this code where you lose your smoothness of the representation of the visual world. So uh, an example of, of a code that, that kind of doesn't have the smoothness would be like a deep neural network that's susceptible to adversarial attacks, if you've heard of those. So you change a single pixel and then the, uh, the network might say that this is a, a, a different species like it's a fish instead of a cat and so you th these are these are examples of, of networks that aren't robust to these small perturbations but ideally the brain is robust to these kinds of small perturbations where you change a pixel in your visual field hopefully your perception of the world doesn't change so we think kind of neural neural activity is kind of in this sweet spot between being as high dimensional as possible while still maintaining smooth representations um so I'm just going to stop briefly here. And if anyone wants to ask questions about this part before I move on to how we visualize this type of data, I think I can see a question here. Um, oh, sorry, that's from before. All right, if, if we're good, then I'm just going to keep moving. Uh, so there, uh, so, okay, sorry, I got a, a thumbs up. Okay, so there are other types of high dimensional data that also have this power law decay. So uh, it's not just stimulus driven activity, this example of, of neural uh, responses driven by these visual stimuli. Uh, there's also spontaneous activity, which is activity we record in the absence of, of external visual stimuli. Those, that activity also decays as a power law. Uh, additionally, uh, zebrafish whole brain activity. So this is, this is many thousands of neurons recorded in the zebrafish brain. The, that activity also has this power law eigenspectrum. And then uh, natural images, 
uh, they have a, uh, uh, they also have a, a power law eigen spectrum. And, and this has kind of been well documented in the past. They have this, this feature of self-similarity. So these lower eigenvalues, their eigenvectors are similar to the eigenvectors in these higher PCs. And so when you zoom in, you see kind of the same thing as you zoom into the image. Um, and then the uh, English language, if you look at correlations between words within sentences, that, that matrix also has power law decay. And then also social networks have this power law decay. Uh, so I see a question. Um, if you're recording from multiple retina topic fields, how might this contribute to the dimensionality estimates? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, and what we found is that if you put two receptive field uh, areas that are two areas that have different receptive fields together, then the power law actually becomes a bit flatter. So it, it's not as um, you're, you're exploring more dimensions in, in a sense of, of the neural space. Uh, than you would be if you're just recording from a single retinotopic field. So uh, does that kind of make sense? Uh, okay, I, I'm just gonna keep, keep going because I, I think there's a bit of a, a lag with my computer looking at the question. Okay, so, um, so, what we want to do is be able to visualize this high dimensional activity that that we've seen. Um, yes, impact of noise is a is a is a great question. And so that's why we've actually we developed a technique to be able to try to avoid um, try to get rid of the impact of noise. and And our technique is basically you need to have at least two repeats of each response to the to the same visual stimulus. And then you do a cross-validated principal components method where you take the eigenvalue, the eigenvectors from one set of responses, and then you compute the singular values or the eigenvalues after you project the data into those eigenvectors you found on that separate part of the data. And then, so this is a, a way to get these eigenvalues in a cross-validated way. And maybe at the end, I can, I can show you a slide about that. Uh, but, but yeah, so that, that is a very important question. Um, and something in the paper, we have several simulations uh, of different types of noise and how they influence the eigen spectrum estimation. Okay, so in order to uh, create, uh, we want a, a plot of neural activity that's, that's more informative, for instance, than just this raster plot where we randomly sorted these neurons and, and have this, this time axis or this stimulus axis. So we created this algorithm, which uh, you, it's an embedding algorithm, but you can also think of it as just resorting this, this axis here. And if you resort this axis so that neurons that are correlated to each other are next to each other, then you get something that uh, looks much, uh, much more uh, visually, the, the clusters become much more visually apparent in the neural activity. So you can see groups of neurons. This is a group of around uh, close to a thousand neurons that are firing together uh, throughout this recording. Uh, raster map also gets uh, is able to capture kind of these long these long uh, range correlations across many many neurons so across these many thousands of neurons and so this is a group of, of many neurons that are firing in the same way and these are representing kind of being able to capture these these lower dim, uh, these lower dimensional principal components that have more variance in the population activity so how does a uh, raster map uh, kind of perform this, this uh, uh, apply these constraints of this power law multi-scale constraint to this embedding algorithm. So I'll, I'll build up to it in a sense. So you can think of the, the first thing, naive thing you might do is to, to do k-means on your data and see uh, what the result is. So here's an example of k-means with 50 clusters on our data. And it, it is useful, you are, are you seeing structure in the, in the neural activity? Uh, but these clusters aren't really in the right order in a sense. So if you look at uh, a correlation matrix of, of neurons sorted using this, this k-means clustering, you can see a lot of off-diagonal structure. So we haven't perfectly sorted this neural activity in the way that we might have wanted to. And also we look at if we plot the, this sorting as kind of a snake through principal components space. So every single neuron has a weighting onto, onto the first three principal components. And so that is a single, each neuron is a single dot here. And then we draw a line through these dots. And that tells us 
basically the line through this this embedding that we made. And if you look, this is this is like a tangled ball. So we haven't really um, kind of separated the captured kind of the more global structure of, of the neural activity by just doing this k-mean sorting. So uh, you can start adding constraints to this. You can add local constraints where you, you basically smooth over the cluster means as you do the optimization. And this allows you to start putting things closer to each other that, that are more correlated to each other. Uh, you can see longer, larger groups of neurons that have similar activity. And you can start to see this untangling. And then finally, if you apply these multi-scale constraints, uh, where you have uh, you have um, more of these global constraints on on the activity being similar, you're able to now get these these larger groups of neurons being fi firing together, basically being put in the same spot on the on the raster map if they fire together. And then this this correlation matrix now looks looks even better. You're you're able to capture even more of the structure along this diagonal region uh, rather than having more of these off-diagonal subclusters. And if you look at this snake, it's more separated along the along these um, along this this axis, and, and these colors are representing different portions of this axis. So it's better it's better preserved the, this global structure as well. So how do we apply these multi-scale constraints? So we're going to we're going to kind of reframe this embedding algorithm in terms of a matrix decomposition algorithm where we model each neuron R sub K, where K is the neuron, as a function of a scaling term times a function F, which is a function of the position of the neuron along this, this one dimensional embedding and time. And we make F a separable function of space and time, where it's a sum of basis functions uh, times uh, coefficients, where these basis functions are have the, the spatial different spatial scales. So the first basis function is going to have this slow, uh, this slow change across the manifold, and then these across the manifold embedding, and then these these higher frequency ones are higher are higher basis functions with higher n, and then the coefficients are where we enforce this multi-scale constraint or this power law constraint. So these coefficients are forced so that the, the norms of each of these coefficients decays as one over n. So the first component has the most weight, and that's this one that changes the most slowly across our embedding dimension. And then as you increase n, uh, you, you start to decrease the amount of variance that, that these components have. So you're, you're trying to enforce the, this global similarity of neurons in the, in the embedding space. And the way that we optimize this is we can rewrite B and A as matrices, where B is going to be uh, neurons by components, where if we plug in X, and then A will be uh, will be neuro uh, sorry time points by components, and then we do an iterative optimization where we fix where we put the neurons along the embedding, and then we fit lambda and A, and then we fix lambda and A, and we and we fit B. Uh, and this is this is easy to do in closed form because we have this uh, least squares loss function. And at, after each optimiz after each iter iteration of the optimization, we force that these norms decay as one over n. And so that that's how we fit this this algorithm. So let me show you some results. Basically, first kind of qualitatively exploring this power law in the stimulus driven uh, in the stimulus driven activity. So we can t let's look at first the, the top principal components of the of the activity. So we're going to take our neural activity and project it into the top principal components. Sorry. Uh, so we have this is the projection of the neural activity into PC one and two, and we've sorted the neurons using raster map, and then we've also sorted the images. So this is I mean with any embedding algorithm, you can arbitrarily sort either axis, and so in this case, we've sorted each axis so that we can see. We can see kind of this coarse uh, one-dimensional structure along this projection of the data into these two principal components. And then uh, we can take PCs three through 10, and then we start to see kind of a more multi-dimensional structure uh, uh, where smaller subgroups of neurons are active together uh, in response to smaller groups of, uh, of stimuli. And then as we go to higher PCs, we see uh, fewer, fewer neurons um, being coactive together uh, in response to stimuli and then and so on. And so this is kind of a graphical way to represent this idea of this power law where there's this overall global structure which is is driving all of these neurons throughout the stimulus space. And then 
there's finer groups, subgroups of neurons that are driven for smaller groups of, of stimuli. And then we can also use raster map to kind of explore how neural activity co-varies with external variables. Um, and so in this case, we're going to be looking at electrophysiological recordings done by Nick Simitz, where he recorded from eight neural pixel probes simultaneously. These neural pixel probes are these high density electrodes that have 384 sites each. So he's able to record 3,000 neurons simultaneously with, with EFIS, so with high temporal precision. And so we've, we've uh, embedded these neurons in, in this one dimensional raster map uh, from, from his recordings. And so you can see this global structure again uh, that we saw previously where there's large groups of neurons co-activating. And then there's smaller subgroups of hundreds of neurons which are co-active together as well in, in this embedding. And so what, what we found in this work was that the spontaneous neural activity, so when the mouse is sitting in the dark, uh, but free to run, whisk, groom, sniff, all these different behaviors, that indeed these behaviors were what was driving this, this neural activity. So whether what the mouse was doing at any given time told us, uh, gave us uh, a prediction of the neural activity. And this prediction was predict, sorry, uh, this predicted about uh, a third of the explainable variance in the neural activity. And so raster map is going to give us a way to visualize this prediction. So for every single neuron, we're going to take the principal components of the motion energy of the face of the mouse. And we're going to use those to predict the neural activity. And we're going to replace, basically, we're going to sort these neurons that have been predicted in the same way we sorted them with raster map above. So now we get this graphical representation of our prediction where we can start to look, OK, this prediction did a good job of, of representing kind of these global structures. Maybe some of these smaller subgroups of neurons were well represented uh, with this behavioral prediction. You can start to go in and say, OK, there's different subgroups of neurons that were not well predicted by the behavior. And it might be easier to see them graphically when you when you make a plot of, of this sort. Uh, so and then there's a, another another thing you can do with raster map, which might be you want to explore spatial relationships between neurons in your recording. And I'll do this uh, on an example of uh, zebrafish neural activity. So there's uh, there's many thousands of neurons being recorded here. And as they light up, that's that's them firing this red color. And you can see the stimulus that's being shown at any given time is this is this block here. And then this bottom circle, as when it's getting bigger, that means the fish is swimming. So there, there's uh, you're able to have behavioral and uh, and uh, visual correlates uh, of this neural activity. So here's what this neural activity looks like, sorted by raster map. So this is 64,000 neurons recorded simultaneously by Yumu when he was in Misha Aaron's lab. And so you can see that, we're, that there's many thousands of neurons doing very similar things. And then there will be smaller subgroups of neurons that are doing different things in this fish brain. And what I'm going to do to explore the spatial relationships between neurons is I'm going to take groups of 500 neurons each and color them based on their position along this embedding graph. And then you can look at these different uh, groups of neurons and see, are they, are they co-localized in the brain? Are they global components? Uh, you can also, for instance, maybe make a plot of how correlated each of these clusters is to a certain behavior along this axis as well. Uh, so it gives you different ways to explore your data. And, and finally, uh, I'll tell you quickly about uh, our, our 2D extension of, of raster map, which is basically we can do this the same, uh, the same tricks that we did using 1D raster map, but then use basis functions, which are two dimensional. In this case, the basis functions are principal components from natural images, but you could use any uh, complete basis set in two dimensions that you want to use. And so if we use two-dimensional raster map, now we're going to have neurons embedded in the 2D space, which is going to be more similar to what you often see when people do TC plots, for instance. And so I'm going to show you uh, embeddings. These are recordings done by Mihaly. So he did four recordings in five different mice. And this, this summed up to around 300,000 neurons. So you can kind of make this functional atlas of all of these neurons in, in, these, in these recordings. And you can kind of see islands of, of neurons that are active together. Uh, you could plot, for instance, you could color these based on what receptive fields these came from, or what mouse they came from, what cell type they were. Uh, all these different things can be, can be done kind of in this, uh, in this visualization. 
And in the graphical user interface for raster map, we've implemented a way for the user to be able to draw boxes around these little islands. Uh, and you can also run uh, density-based clustering as well to kind of to capture these islands, but you can also manually kind of draw clusters uh, because it, the, the 2D representation is still hard for hard to parse. Like if there's an advantage of using 2D in that you have another dimension to play with, you're able to better explain the variance of your data, but it's still it's hard to visualize the, two dimen the 2D because you, you still wanna visualize how this varies, for instance, across stimuli. So if you draw these boxes, then you can get in the in the GUI, you get this plot uh, where these boxes are, are sorted here uh, by actually by raster map 1D, and then you can plot basically neurons by stimuli it, within this 2D raster map. So this allows you to kind of explore your data maybe more easily. And then finally, how well does raster map work quantitatively? So uh, we we use a benchmark where we're trying the what we're trying to optimize basically is how correlated is an, a given neuron to its n nearest neighbors. So and this is the mean of the activity of its n nearest neighbors. So if we have this neuron here, we want to say how correlated is it to the activity of its one nearest neighbor to the average activity of its four nearest neighbors, 16, 64, 56, 1024, and so on. And so we can we get, we make these curves of of this correlation uh, of neurons. We average this over over all the neurons that we subsample, and we can make this curve as a function of number of neighbors for various different embedding algorithms. So, raster map, for instance, on zebrafish data performs better than UMAP, TSNE, and PCA in terms of capturing these local uh, these local uh, groups of clusters within around 64 to 256 neurons. You can see is doing better than than these other algorithms. And then similarly, in this, this large scale data with 300,000 neurons, uh, raster map outperforms TSNE, UMAP, and, and PCA in kind of this middle range of, of neighbors where we have these kind of so, somewhat larger groups of neighbors than just uh, where, uh, than groups of maybe one to four. So, so that's, um, that's pretty much it. I'll just tell you also that raster map is, is fast. So raster map runs in about 10 minutes on 300,000 neuron data. And it, compared to TSNE, which takes around 70 minutes, it's not as fast as, as UMAP. Um, and, then it's, and then also PCA is faster. All right, so in summary, uh, I've showed you that neural activity is high dimensional. So this means that we need to think about ways to visualize high dimensional data. And, and so we came up with this algorithm raster map that's, that's capturing this high dimensional structure. And it's also fast and open source. You can pip install raster map and, and draw clusters and, and play with your, load your data and run it and, and play with the, the clusters in, in this 2D space. You can also install raster map and run it the same way you run scikit-learn packages. And that's it. I'd like to thank my advisors, Marius Pakisaryu and Kenneth Harris and all the collaborators I've had at UCL and Janelia. And also, I just started my group at Janelia, and I'm looking for postdocs and students who are interested in these kinds of computational questions of how the brain encodes sensory and behavioral representations. Um, and that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. That was, that was really a lovely talk. Um, I want to give, I know I agree, I think there's a bit of a lag between when, when we're talking and when questions come in. So I want to give people a couple seconds to, to get some questions in, but maybe I want to start with one, um, which is that, you know, you, you talk about uh, that you consciously made this open source. Um, and something we think about in Nylearn is a lot is the usability of methods and the availability of methods. Um, could you talk a little bit about maybe why you made that decision and uh, how you think um, having the software implementation helps with the with the method itself, testing the method itself? Yeah, um, I think I definitely that's that's an important component. The fact that it's it's the same as any scikit-learn package means that someone can quickly just plug in raster map the same way they plug in TSNE and test all these methods and. Honestly, someone that, that's interested in, in embedding their data should try all these different methods because they're not that slow to run. Uh, so I recommend once you set it up for one, you can set it up for all of them. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think that's a big advantage of it. And there's lots of great packages in, in Python that, that make these, these algorithms fast to run. 
for instance, this is accelerated by number. Mm-hmm. All right, I think, here we go. Okay, I think there's a, a question for you. I can read it out if it's easier or if you, let's see, all right. so. Uh, the question is, did I understand correctly that we can easily apply raster map to arbitrary data, even non-neural? Yeah, you can apply it to any high dimensional data set and see what happens. It, it's, it, when you're applying it to different data sets, uh, there's one thing you can, you can do, which is to, uh, which is to change this, uh, Sorry, I went too far back. To change the power law spectrum. So you can actually, there's a parameter that you can set that, sorry, I don't think I said it, where this, this parameter here of one over N can be changed to be one over N to any arbitrary alpha. So you can change that in your data to play with how much you wanna preserve local structure versus preserve global structure. Uh, and this is a kind of idea that, that could be extended to other types of, of methods, like maybe in a regression you might wanna apply a power law to your to your data as well, or enforce a power law, that sort of thing, to be able to capture high dimensional structure. And then Eva Dyer asks a question as well, which is, uh, I might have missed it, do you estimate the power law from the data? No, we do not, um, in part because that would require the user to kind of tell us if they have two repeats of data or in the case of if we're estimating on arbitrary data, we would use something um, where we would have to split by neurons and time. That's another, another way we cross validate things. So we're not doing that for the user because that's very uh, case dependent. So yeah, I think I think the other thing I find really interesting about this is the the fact that you, um, in some ways, it seems so far from fMRI data. In other ways, it seems like you could easily imagine sort of the fact that you're recording all of these planes at once in cortex that the, you're getting this large sample and you're able to look across the whole population to kind of look at these dynamics. Um, and I'm just wondering. Do you, do you see personally any kind of connection to, to maybe fMRI work or MEG work or, or this uh, at a human level scale? Yeah, I, I, think, I think this is the sort of algorithm that would work well for that type of data because in particular, uh, raster maps agnostic to temporal correlations. It's, it's like PCA where every bin is independent of another bin. It's not thinking about these kinds of autocorrelation functions. And so in data where there's a slow time scale where you're only sampling at one to three hertz or something, then that's the kind of data that that this is 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 good for. Uh, if you have some kind of temporal dynamics you're trying to capture, maybe you want to use some some uh, slightly different method or extend a method like this to to try to capture uh, temporal correlations. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Thanks for inviting me. No, thanks so much for coming. Okay, if there are no further questions, maybe uh, what we can do is there's, we'll start the break and I just wanna uh, plug again quickly that we have this online town. Um, so if you, if you go to the uh, event website and you click on the hyperlink on break, it will take you to a little portal where you can actually kind of interact um, in a virtual exp uh, room. To, to meet other attendees and to chat about the talks this morning, um, which have both been really lovely so far. And we're looking forward to the rest of the day. So thanks so much. <laughs>